What have you done? Oh, Warden. Don't be such a prude. Ooh! Ah, uh, I hope you're cream-filled. Uh -huh. Adult Swim has always been known for its crazy shows and willingness to experiment. Half of their stuff just feels like a joke someone made got out of hand. Like, wouldn't it be nuts if Birdman was a lawyer? Then you blink and it's got four seasons of video game and a spinoff. Jude, masturbation is... Freddy Prince Jr. Freddy Prince Jr. But just because most of this stuff comes off as streams of consciousness doesn't mean it wasn't quality. Stuff like Aqua Teen was cheaply made, but it was some of the funniest stuff out there. And shows like The Boondocks and Venture Brothers proved that adult animation could have some serious quality behind it. But for me, the most impressive thing about Adult Swim was that every show was so distinctly its own thing. Nothing but creators creating the stuff that they loved, all wrapped up in Adult Swim's extremely chill aesthetic. Even nowadays where it feels like Rick and Morty is guided by the taint, it's the only channel left that still feels like it has an identity. And that's because of all the freedom it gives its creators. And this freedom can lead to some out there stuff. But there is one show that stands above all others when it comes to pushing the envelope. A show so foul, so raunchy, so downright disturbing that I don't think it'll ever be taught. And that show is Mr. Pickles. Get me out of here but before the baby man comes back for more milk. What? <laughs> But Super Jail is a close second. Huh? Shut up, bitch. Ah, uh, yes, Super Jail, the thinking man's cartoon. I still remember back when it dropped. There was nothing like it at the time, and there hasn't been anything like it since. It was so crazy to see this level of violence and debauchery shown on TV, even on Adult Swim. And yeah, I just used the word debauchery. We're about to talk Super Jail, I gotta get fancy. This show took a simple premise like following the life of inmates and turned it into one of the most impressive visual spectacles ever to grace the small screen. They even threw in a Tumblr sexy man for flavor. But like I mentioned before, this show was nasty. Like Ted Cruz's search history nasty. Not just violence, but tons of other stuff too. Some of which might not have aged the best. But I think it's still worth talking about, if only for the visual stuff. And you might not believe me, but there is some actual substance thrown in there too. So today, we're gonna look at what made Super Jail such an interesting series. And maybe, just maybe, we'll all come out as better people when we're done. But probably not. If any Anything will end up worse. I'm your host and judge, jury, and executioner, D'Angelo Edwards, and today I'm taking my hat off to Super Jail. Super Jail was created by Christy Karakis, Steven Warbrick, and Ben Gruber. The trio were mostly known for their work at MTV, with Christy and Stefan both working on Daria, while Ben had done a short for Cartoon Sushi, a show on MTV that showed off a bunch of different animated projects. Christy had also done some work for Cartoon Sushi, having his student film Space War be featured on it. Later on, him and Stefan teamed up to make another short film called Bar Fight. It was three and a half minutes of pure 
chaos. Just a bunch of dudes beating the crap out of each other and having the time of their lives doing it. It was a pretty impressive level of violence. Well, maybe it was impressive to me, but it must not have impressed anyone else because no film festival would take it. Imagine making the cartoon equivalent of scaring the hose away. Yeah, but the hose! Oh, what? It's too hard to get the hose! That's why when Stefan and Christy got the call that adult women not only seen Bar Fight, but also wanted them to pitch something to them, it was so shocking. Christy had an old pitch that he had been developing about a jail that functioned like a reality show, but both of them thought that sounded boring. So instead, they decided to build onto Bar Fight and make the most dangerous jail ever to exist, where the craziest riots would break out daily. A place that existed outside the normal world, where every rule and regulation came from the whims of a psychotic man-child. You know, something like America, but a bit more safe. Together with Gruber, the three of them reworked this idea into Super Jail. Ah! Hello there. You're in Super Jail. I'm the warden, and you're a criminal. Super Jail focuses on the exploits of the Warden, a Willy Wonka-esque man with unknown power and wealth who used every resource at his command to create the titular Super Jail. More of its own country than a jail, Super Jail houses some of the worst criminals ever to exist. It's where Ezra Miller would go if they could just catch him. Super Jail is full of technological wonders and reality-defying attractions. Living vegetables, vengeful ghosts, and more litter the place, adding to the chaos already created by the prisoners staying there. The warden is assisted by Jared, his anxiety-riddled assistant who hops from vice to vice. Alice, the sadistic head guard who uses Super Jail's her own personal harem, and Jailbot, a robot created by the warden to keep the prisoners in line, mostly by turning them into paste. Every episode focuses on either a new whim of the warden, fighting against a new threat to Super Jail, or the inmates themselves messing with something they shouldn't. While I guess you could say every episode had a plot, what little there was was mostly just an excuse to show off Super Jail's signature brutal fight montages, which features some pretty stunning animation as long as you can stomach it. Not to say that the show was only violence though, it was pretty funny too. All of this world's riches as my sincere thanks. Oh! What? Oh, that oh, burns! As the show went on, however, it evolved from just extended fight scenes to be more character driven, while still retaining the hyper violence it was known for. I feel like by the end of it, I had really got to know the characters in it, and while I wouldn't approach any of them in real life, they all have a certain charm to them. But before we get into how the show evolved, we have to start at the beginning, and it all started with season one. <laughs> I think the best way to describe season 1 of Super Jail is stylishly formulaic. Almost every single episode follows the same plot structure. The warden gets an idea, he enforces said idea, and that idea then backfires and leads to a giant orgy of violence and destruction. Every episode even starts with the same criminal, Jackknife, getting captured and taken back to Super Jail by Jailbot. While this sounds like it would get stale pretty quickly, the thing that made it entertaining to watch from start to finish was the art style, animation quality, and just pure energy that the show exuded. Like this show is just what happens when a sugar high goes too far. The creators really wanted everything to feel loose and organic. Nothing stays on model, locations hardly ever get reused, and something is always moving. Either a character or something in the background. Even the landscape when Jackknife is getting carried back changes every episode. The show was made in Flash, and Super Gel is yet a another show that proves that it's not the program, but the work you put into a project. Christy and Stefan both wanted the show to have a hand-drawn traditional look to it, and every part of it was hand-drawn, rather than using the tweening that Flash is known for. It's some super impressive stuff. Even when the warden is just talking, he's always moving or transforming into different stuff, it's nuts. To get this level of quality, the team hired Augen Blick Studios, an animation studio that at the time was probably best known for its work on Wonder Chosen. Oh man. And do you guys remember Wonder Chosen? That's the show that separates the boys from the boys you probably want to avoid looking in the eye. Oh, well, what do you think about TV? I think you suck, bitch. Now get out of my face. But besides that, they also went on to work on Ugly Americans, Mad, Gold and the Insatiable, and a bunch of other stuff. 
Christie said he went to them because they had what it took to make everything look good while still retaining that gritty hand-drawn look that he loved in animation. And surprisingly, all the animation for Super Jail was done in-house. Even back in 2008, that was insane. I don't know how you pull something off like that without either a lot of talent or a lot of coke. But boy did they do it. And this really helped to give the show an identity all its own. The earlier episodes were formulaic but still memorable. The warden opening a bar is an excuse to ask Alice out, the prison getting suckered into a cult-like pyramid scheme, or traveling through the inmates' dreams to find out which of them will start a riot. But it's in the escalation that makes Super Jail really stick out. Whatever show starts with a bar being opened, then ends with an underwater battle with Atlanteans. I could tell you every plot point between the start and the end, and you would still have a hard time connecting the dots. But that's what makes it so fun. Nothing needs to make sense, and no matter who dies, by the next episode, everyone is okay again, only to get murdered all over again. As the show goes on, we get to know a couple of the inmates better. There's Gary, a prisoner who's based on real-life criminal Robert Stroud, better known as the Birdman of Alcatraz. He's a silent dude with a strange connection to his pet bird. While he never talks, you always get the feeling that he's the one pulling all the strings behind the scenes. There's also Paul and Jean. A couple that's usually seen either bickering, making up, or causing mayhem. Sometimes all three at once. You already know they're based on the more, uh, let's say less PC stereotypes about prison. But I won't lie, sometimes they are kinda cute. There's also the twins, a pair of aliens that run around treating the jail like their own personal playhouse, egging on the warden to do even crazier things, just for their amusement. I relate to them a lot. But my favorite prisoner is Ash, a pyromaniac with a heart of gold. He just seems so innocent. I don't think he wants to hurt anyone, he just really, really, really likes watching stuff burn. And sometimes that stuff is people, who cares, they're everywhere. He's actually in the center of what is probably the sweetest episode of the series, with him and some other inmates taking in a little girl that accidentally got sent to super jail. For a bunch of murderous psychos, they actually make a cute family. Sadly, by the end of the episode, the girl passes away, and I was actually left feeling a little bummed, like actual human empathy. I thought I got rid of all that stuff. In season one, there's also an introduction of another important group of characters. Standing in as a rival for Super Jail, we have Ultra Prison, a female counterpart featuring gender swapped versions of all the characters. Instead of Alice, we have Bruce. Instead of Jarrett, we have Cherise. And instead of the Warden, we have the Mistress. I like the Mistress. While initially disgusted by how the warden runs things in Super Jail, after a little party and the introduction of some Spanish fly by the twins, let's just say the mistress warms up to the warden, at least for a little bit. Thanks for the great sex, loser! Though the biggest takeaway from this meeting is the relationship formed between Jared and Charisse, who bond over being overworked by their respective crazy bosses. And so the show continued going on from outlandish plot to outlandish plot, without really trying to be anything other than a fun ride. That is until the finale of season 1, where they crank everything up to 11. It looks like it's just you and me now, Jailba. Is this really the end of Super Jail? The season finale starts off with the Warden getting the idea to franchise Super Jail, building multiple ones all over the country to enforce his own wacky brand of justice. That idea is so crazy. Like what kind of sadistic person would use incarceration as a means to generate a profit? And who let this elephant into the room? Anyway, once he gets this idea, the Warden disappears, only to realize that he's been arrested himself by the Time Police. Yep, turns out that in the future, by franchising Super Jail, the Warden would basically end up taking over the entire world, turning it into one giant prison state. So, 
To stop this from ever happening, the Time Police get him before he can enact his plans. This unfolds in the series' first two-parter, showing Alice, Jared, and Jailbot having to get by without the Warden, and showing the Super Jail go full-on primitive, with Gary and Bird starting a new species of bird-human hybrids. It's a really fun time going through all the different locations and seeing the future world ruled by the Warden, and it's the biggest spectacle yet, ultimately ending in a battle with both the present and future versions of the crew, teaming up to defeat the Time Police. This does have the unfortunate effect of completely destroying the time stream though, but hey, you can't win them all. But man, did season 1 go out with a bang. It actually had a compelling story. The fight scenes were more impressive than ever, and it was cool seeing what would happen if Super Jail ever left his bubble, and it was all this momentum that the show had built up that made it even weirder when it just disappeared for a while. I remember wondering if more was coming. The show did look expensive to make, and with that level of violence on display, I thought that maybe the show had just been cancelled. But after three years of waiting, Super Jail returned, and it was better than ever. You know, instead of this disgusting pizza, you should have got Super Jail, Season 2 on DVD. A few things changed about the show that I think improved it a lot. First of all, the show started focusing a lot more on the characters instead of just displaying tons of violence every second. Which, don't get me wrong, I love that stuff. No notes. But it's never a bad thing to just make me care a tad bit more about the people that all that blood came from. We get to spend a lot more quieter moments with both the staff and the prisoners. We dive a bit deeper into Jared's history with addiction and depression. We get to see the two gay inmates John and Paul get married, while learning about their past as rival gang leaders. The warden pretty much stays the same, but like even more of a sociopath. Like I need to take notes. But we do start to see more of his childhood, back when his father was teaching him to be a warden, showing that even he went through some trauma in his past. A lot of this came from bringing in Chris McCullough, the creator of Venture Brothers, on as a writing consultant, in addition to him also voicing Gene. The crew had admitted that writing was always the thing they struggled with the most, so Chris helped to patch up that weak spot. Besides the writing and the character stuff, we also get a major bump up in animation, which was already the show's strongest aspect. From this point on, the show started being animated by Titmouse, one of my favorite animation studios ever. Everything got a bump up in quality, the character acting got so much more expressive, the action scenes started messing with perspective a lot more, making the carnage even more bombastic. And it was still all done in-house, with no overseas animation being contracted. This actually proved to be a bit of a problem sometimes, because it was harder to find animators trained in this style in New York, since most of those guys were already in California. But, after a few days of animation boot camp, as the creators put it, they managed to whip up a team just as good, if not better than their old one. But back to the show itself. One of the biggest new additions to the show was Stingray. You will address me as Lord Stingray! <laughs> Played by Eric Bauza, a spoof of villains like Cobra Commander, he even came with his own G.I. Joe knockoffs. After failing to take over Super Jail, he instead becomes a prisoner there himself, as he becomes the main antagonist of the series for the rest of the show. He's such a jerk. The episodes that focus around him are really fun. He bounces off the more childish warden really well, a fact that the internet definitely picked up on. Man, you animals really can't let anything slide, huh? It's whatever though. I fear you, but I also respect you. Though season 2 was a nice jump in quality, it was season 3 I think where they really perfected it. The perfect balance of top tier animation and fun characters to follow. By now, we had a central group of inmates that we hung around. We got crazy plots like Lord Stingray and the Mistress getting together, a dummy coming to life and ruling the jail, and we even got to meet the twins relatives. All this led up to a season finale where Ash teaches the Warden to control fire, leading the Super Jail becoming a hell on Earth. Well, more so than usual. This episode actually ends with a cliffhanger that picks up in the fourth season. A naked orgy? I would have dumped you too. We did it! Ah, I thought I told you to keep that disfigured one away from me. <laughs> 
the fourth season is sadly the last season of Super Jail that was produced. In my opinion, it's better than season two, but not quite as good as season three. I don't know. Season three just feels like everything fell into place perfectly. I think it might be the fact that season four is only six episodes long instead of the usual 10 or 11. It felt like it was building up to something, but it just ends on like a standard episode. Unlike the other seasons, which all had special finale episodes. Doesn't mean it's not good though, and I still enjoyed my time with it. I especially like the episode Jean, Paul, Beefy, and Alice, because we get some nice bonding moments between the four. But bringing up Alice, I do have to talk about how she's kind of a red mark on the series as a whole. Look, I am definitely not the guy to talk about this, but I do think that the way they portrayed Alice is a little eyebrow raisy. This show started in 2008, and people were not that nice to the LGBTQ community back then. It's a little better now, and now that I'm not some dumb teenager, I can see how she could be seen as offensive. And if you don't want to watch this show because of her, I think that's totally valid. I doubt the creators had any actual malice when they made her, and they did say that what makes her likable is that she's so confident in herself despite the less than flattering portrayal. Again, I'm not the guy to pass judgment on this kind of thing, but I don't think I could finish this video without at least bringing it up. So, once season 4 wrapped up, that was it for Super Jail. The show was quietly cancelled, as no plans for renewal were passed around, and everyone went their separate ways. Christy Karakis went on to create Ball Masters, another Adult Swim show known for its stylish and bombastic animation, as well as directing Robotomy, a Cartoon Network show that was basically a PG version of Super Jail. Ben Gruber would go off and write for shows like Breadwinners, Teen Titans Go, and Jellystone, while Steven Warbrick seemed to retire from animation at the Super Joe. And to be fair, I don't blame him. With a show as intensive as this, I wouldn't want to pick up a pencil for at least 20 years. But I think that the team really made something they could be proud of. Something with a unique voice, style, and flair all its own. Sure, it could be crude, disgusting, and sometimes downright offensive, but there is nothing out there that is quite like Super Joe. And it stands out even among the diverse library that Adult Swim has created. You could tell that everyone on the team was improving as they worked on it. The action got bigger, the jokes got funnier, and just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, the next episode would prove you wrong. It's definitely one of the most iconic shows that Adult Swim has ever created. And if you can get past that layer of filth, it's definitely worth the watch. Trust me, it would be a crime if you pass this one up.